people who shouldn't buy businesses never will because it's a long winding road with a lot of off ramps because it takes grit. You're managing financial diligence. You're managing the business diligence. So you're trying to understand the business model, the workings of things, how you're going to improve it. What's your business plan for it? The legal elements of things you're, you're, you know, running the the lawyer and the negotiation process and you're making legal decisions there. The lender, you're convincing a lender to give you millions of dollars. You're sometimes convincing investors to give you millions of dollars. And so it's a long, hard process that takes grit. And oftentimes you're working a job too. And you've got a family, right? You got kids and whatever else. And like dad's wanting to move us from the suburbs of Virginia to Breckenridge, Colorado to run a fencing business. Like what the hell? Like we got to go get school. And it's it's, it takes grit to get through it. And so my thesis is that a person that can pull that off, Chris, is going is to be successful in business, right? This is a gritty, determined, confident human being that is going to be as successful as anybody else. If they could do all that and get to the end of the process, like who am I to tell them that they're not qualified to, to run a business or buy a business? Eric. Welcome to the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Chris. Huge fan of the show, huge fan of yours. So what a fun way to spend a Friday morning. I appreciate it. The same the same for you. Um, all right, let's start. Uh, we're going to start the story of you are two years ago. Um, you're at a big firm. And we're going to talk about big firms. But you decided to start a Twitter account that kind of changed your life. And today you're running SMB Law, which you kind of said is like the first social media driven law firm, or you say something like that. We got to tell this story because I get asked all the time by people like, hey, should I, should I start an anonymous account? What would it do for me? You have a really cool story. And so I want to tell it. Yeah, it, it is, it's a wild story. It's one of those ones where if it hadn't happened to me, you know, I, I, I don't know how I'd feel about it necessarily. I know there's some people who are, you know, vocal opponents of the anonymous account, like Nick, Nick Huber, um, <laughs> you know, and that believe that, you know, vocal opponents of lots of things, but particularly the anonymous account, um, and believe that, you know, you'll get more traction if you are yourself on social media. And, and I think that's true, right? I wasn't sure when I flipped from anonymous to public, like how it would go. Went really well. I think uh, people actually, it, it increased the engagement. I think more people were interested. But there's a lot of folks out there, Chris, that can't be anonymous on social media. Or sorry, can't be public on social media because of day jobs and whatever else, investors, you, you know you, you know how it is. Um, but yeah, the, the, the long story short is I was at Kirkland & Ellis, which is a large global transactional law firm, arguably, depending on who you ask, you know, the best um, corporate law firm on the planet um, in Dallas, actually was working remotely. Um, and I fell in love with entrepreneurship through acquisition, which is a really cool um, trend in the economy because of the silver tsunami or the great wealth transfer, which we can talk about. There's a lot of businesses that need to be sold that don't have anybody to sell them to. And so they've got to go out to the market to sell them. And a lot of really smart folks, um, you know, in fact, the seminal piece um, book in the space was the Harvard Business Review Guide to Buying a Small Business written in 2017. And now what you're seeing is a trend of elite MBAs that typically would go to Wharton, McKinsey, Wall Street that are saying, forget that. You know, I'm going to go buy uh, an enduringly profitable, quote unquote, small business that's got clients and a brand and it's been around for 20 years in a very boring space and, you know, buy a million dollars in earnings for two and a half to four times earnings um, and, you know, pay the SBA debt off as quickly as possible and be a debt free cash flowing millionaire, typically for most of them since they're like 27 when they graduate from these MBA programs by like their early 30s. So it's massively popular, but they're just the tip of the spear, right? Economically, there is a ton of people across the country that are looking to buy these businesses. Everybody from the blue collar dude who trimmed trees for 15 years and now wants to buy a tree trimming business or the business he worked for, all the way up to these elite MBAs that are saying, hey, I'm going to forego going to you know Goldman Sachs on Wall Street and move to you know middle of nowhere, Tennessee to buy a commercial cleaning business. Um, so it's 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 fascinating, and you know it all started with the social media, um, and then you know I'm rambling here, but um, it culminated yesterday. Kind of a cool moment for us at our firm yesterday. Our quarter Q2, we didn't exist 12 months ago. We launched this firm to do small business M and A 
quarter two, we did 25 transactions for $142 million. <laughs> um, so awesome. really awesome. And all started from social media. So very, very interesting. Okay. Uh, there's a lot to unpack there, but you were at K&E, Kirkland and Ellis, um, which by the way, why are they considered the best? What, what makes them great? Private equity M&A, okay. right? So they get a lot of at-bats because they do a ton of private equity M&A. And private equity M&A, they're repeat buyers. And so it drives a ton of fees. And when you drive a ton of revenue, it, you know, one, you get really good at what you do when you do, do it over and over and over again. Um, and then two, um, they've been really aggressive in growing that firm. And they've, cha- they, they've changed a lot of things in big law. We can talk about big law, but you know, for a long time, the large elite big law firms like Cravath, you know, like the most storied firms in the world had these very, you know, honorable and noble systems of, you know, each year lockstep, you make a certain amount more. And over time, you know, you're going to do fantastic and everybody played by the rules. And then about a half decade ago, Kirkland changed that among other firms, but primarily Kirkland and said, no, we're just going to pay boatloads of money for the best lawyers and finally broke Cravath even after two centuries of lockstep compensation. So a very interesting evolving um, corporate, but Kirkland's kind of the, everybody hates, loves to hate Kirkland. So I've heard, I've heard great things and I've heard that they're, they're tough. I guess that's what makes them. That's why you pay them the big bucks. Um, I don't know if I want to be on the other side of them or I want them representing me one day. We'll see. Maybe that'll happen. All right. So you get 15,000 employees, I mean, 15,000 followers on Twitter. You started this account basically answering SMB um, questions and just providing a lot of great content and and education to folks. And then you were kind of met with like a crossroads, which is what am I going to do with this? And how did you come to the decision of what to do? Well, for me, it was easy, right? Because I, you know, you're always looking uh, in your career to find that thing that you're good at the thing that you like and the thing that you're passionate about. And it was right there in the middle of those things, right? I had done corporate transactional work, like small business m and It's it's niche and you need to know what you're doing in M&A, but it's, it's very elementary comparatively. Uh, I love the client. I'm so passionate about the, the group of business buyers. The vast majority of them are the same person, right? They're 25 to 45 year old guy or gal, a couple of kids like me, a couple hundred thousand bucks saved up from corporate. They're trying to do something different with their life. That's a group of people that like I'll stay up till three in the morning talking to them about their transaction for free. You know, like I just am very passionate about them as individuals. Um, and then the the but the real reason is that there was so much work coming to us, right? Like pe- person after person that I had networked with because I what I was trying to do is actually leave the law and go buy a business. And then person after person started coming to me going, "Hey, I need a good lawyer for my two, four, six, eight, ten million dollar deal. They need to know M and A. They need to be entrepreneurial." Um, and reasonably priced. And I didn't know that that largely doesn't exist, right? Like there are some folks that will take those deals, but they're one of two things. They're either mid-market lawyers that want to do $50, $100 million deals that know M&A, built for something different. So they make a big mess out of the small business transaction. Um, or they're, you know, the main street guy that's like, I'll do literally anything that walks through the door. I won't tell you that I don't know what I'm doing. And you'll get your ass kicked as a result of this, particularly if you're selling a business. Um, but I'll do the deal. And so that's largely what existed in the marketplace. And once we figured that out, we said, oh shit, like these are people we care about deeply. We're trying to refer them to good lawyers and like it doesn't exist. So, okay, let's let's go consider going and building it. Um, and it was cool because we had the benefit of literally just letting the community take the wheel and say, hey, here's what we want from a lawyer. Here's how we want you to price. Here's what we want to pay. Here's what we want you to do. And we just took that playbook and went and implemented it. And it's it's been, it's been fun. That's awesome. Okay. Um, the silver tsunami is coming. I think it would be interesting just to get your take on what is the, uh, we're calling them the, the professional MBA buyer and then kind of your blue collar school of hard knocks learned lessons from the streets, um, how to do business. Like, could you profile, like, how do they approach buying businesses maybe similarly, but also differently? Yeah, it's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, the the elite MBA has had a lot of excellent textbook um, learning, right? And so they have a tendency to search for a very long time, right? Um, 
the there's two different themes in business buying. There's a traditional search, which is your true elite MBA. And there is a like, kind of a, you know, a group of investors that sponsor these people. And the economics are vastly different than the self-funded searcher who goes off and just buys a business on their own. Um, and in traditional search, there's a lot of statistics around the success and, you know, the metrics and the timing of those individuals. It takes the elite MBA, you know, their economics are different. So that's part of the equation. You've got a lot of people on your cap table, the investment, the business has to be larger. You're looking for something maybe a little bit different than if you're just taking your own personal capital and going and buying a business. But they take a lot longer, right? There's a lot of analysis, paralysis. You've seen things in a case book and you're, you know, you're trying to then go out and apply that in the real world. And it doesn't always, you know, as you know, that's not always how it goes. The the blue collar guy, our clients that are coming to us that are like, hey man, I've been trimming trees for 15 years and now I'm buying a tree trimming business. Like typically they're buying the business that they work for. The lenders love those guys and gals. They love the people who have the in the trenches industry experience because you know you're basically just handing off one enduringly profitable business to the same type of guy or gal. They know how to show up and talk to the crew on day one because that's the biggest thing, right? Like a business is a group of individuals in most cases, particularly service businesses. And you know, you look at it on paper in the marketing department, the sales department, whatever, the operations. And you think about the nuts and bolts of that. Those, that's just a, a, a composite of, of individuals. If you have been one of those individuals within the business, you know, you're you're more likely to be a good fit to, to lead that business into the next generation than somebody from the outside that just happens to know a lot about business. Now, that being said, there's a, a concept in business about you know being promoted to the level with which you eventually reach incompetence. Um, and so, you know, I do worry about some of those folks that have been within the business for a long time and now we're like, okay, because I've been inside the business, I'm necessarily qualified. That's not always the case. So um, really case by case, but had a great interview recently with a guy named John Mahoney and John's fascinating, great interview on our podcast called Monday and Millionaires. Sorry for the shameless self plug there, but (laughs) it's a cool interview. If you're interested in business buying, because John is a Wharton MBA who was in the Marine Corps as an officer for a decade. And the question I asked him is like, which of the skill set was more useful to you in the first six months of running your uh, commercial H- HVAC business? Um, you know, the McKinsey spreadsheets or the leading people in in uh, the Middle East? Um, and so he's got a great answer for that. And so I'll defer to those guys. What's the answer? Well, I think the answer is it depends, right? Like there's there's circumstances with which you've got to know how to lead a business, right? You've got to be able to prepare strategy and think about how you um, grow a business. Because oftentimes the thesis is like, yeah, this is a you know high quality business with eight hundred thousand dollars in earnings, but now I'm going to go put three or four million dollars of SBA debt on it. So you know, to hit some of my targets and to do what I want to do, I got to grow it. So you've got to have that strategic component, but you also have to show up on day one, Chris, stand in the room with these guys. And I, I'll say guys, because a lot of these businesses are really tough. You know, our clientele, they go out and buy roofing, HVAC, tree trimming, commercial cleaning. Like it's a lot of guys, you know, it's a lot of tough blue collar guys. Um, Josh Schultz, if you know Josh, he's no, Josh, uh, well. really great. Yeah, he's uh, uh, runs Canecast um, for Reg Zeller, and and Josh posted a picture of him standing up in a foundry in South Carolina in front of a group of you know gritty blue collar guys. And I retweeted, I'm like, you know, th- if you're gonna buy a business, you got to be prepared on day one to go in that room, stand in front of these people, and communicate to them in a way that's gonna have them believe that at least you're not going to blow the place up, right? We'll give this guy a chance. You're not going to blow him away, right? These are a group of guys that are, you know, hell yeah, you know, Chris is the guy, man. Like, we're going to the moon. God. We're going to the moon, Chris. Uh, no, they're, they're going to go, do I need to go today's, because you're going to do it on a Monday, so they don't have the weekend to think about it. Like, do I need to actively hit the market this week or go, you know, follow up on this or that to go find another gig because I need to keep feeding my family. So you got to have that skill set too. Um, and you know, if you've if you've only ever worked at Goldman Sachs and gone to HBS, like maybe you don't maybe you don't have that. I, you probably know Rich Jordan, right? Yeah, 
Yeah, I did an episode with Rich. Oh, it's one of the best episodes. I mean, what a just world-class guy. But I literally, I'm like, what happened the minute you showed up to the property? And it's not what you think. It's not what the textbook would say. It's like, we went out to the parking lot. I am I think I'm kind of, I'm, I'm going to get this like 70% right. But it was essentially went out to the parking lot. I think they sat on the back of the uh, they pulled down the the hood of a truck and they all sat there and they just kind of talked out like what had just happened. It was this, you know, discussion. And then those first few days was just a lot of, hey, like I'm not here to, you know, change the world. I'm in this with you. It was not this like, hey, I'm your new boss and like everybody get back to work. It's totally building trust. And sometimes that happens yep. in like the parking lot on the hood of a truck. It doesn't happen in like a big fancy corporate boardroom. Yeah. Rich is, Rich is a guy like he is the he's a great guy. If you're thinking about buying a business, go talk to Rich, talk to the Sam Leslie's, the red, the red Zellers, the Josh Schultz is like, those are, are, and there's a lot of good female buyers out there as well, but those are ones that come to mind that like have had to stand in those rooms and have those tough conversations. Okay. So, so then maybe you could also describe just like the dichotomy of, it seems to me, and again, this is kind of a Twitter take, Warren Buffett created this whole generation of people that think you can just kind of buy businesses and own them and like play gin most of the day and they're just going to run each other and, and everything's going to be good. The rise of the hold co. So you find these people that may have never even run a business and they just want to keep buying businesses, but they don't want to run those either versus, hey, I'm going to buy this and run it. Can you just explain like going into buying a business, how both of those actors behave differently when looking for businesses to buy? Maybe the the person that knows they're going to be in it and the person that just wants to own it? Yeah, it's a good philosophical question, right? And it's something that I don't know if you, you know Mike Bakken, but something that Mike and I have talked a lot about because when Mike started Benchmark Group, he bought a pretty small business, like a 300 EBITDA business, like the type of business that a lot of the, you know, the typical... SMB Twitter um, folklore would say, don't buy, you're buying a job, right? But the reality is like, you, you're you you're buying a business in an industry. If, you, if you're coming from the outside, like you need to know how to run that business, particularly, you know, if you're going to lead a group of people. But that being said, I think that the, the traditional wisdom is probably the, the, the better wisdom, which is buy a substantial business that has a layer of management so you have some help right? Because, and so, and, and you retain some knowledge because oftentimes what will happen is you go buy like a 500 to 700 K EBITDA business and the owner is going to transition out. He doesn't have anybody yet. He's been keeping that thing afloat, right? So you, you know, you'll negotiate some transitional services with him for, you know, the SBA will allow them to stay for upwards of 12 months. We had the prospect of a rollover thing with SBA changes, but that looks like that's going away because it's going to require a personal guarantee. So Suffice it to say, you've got best case scenario, you go buy a business that doesn't have existing management. You've got six to 12 months, probably at best, with that person and, and with you know varying levels of sincerity in their commitment to the business at that point because they're on their way out. And there are ways to try to you know put some teeth to it. But suffice it to say, like a lot of the institutional knowledge is going to walk out the door on you. So if you can buy a business that's got a manager in place or somebody who's got long-term incentives to that that has been a part of the history of the business, I think that's a great thing. And you're probably getting a better business and a better investment, a better return by buying a bigger business. But you still the, the, the notion of passive income, I hate it. Like I just I don't think that anything in life is passive. I mean, real estate's about as close as you can get to pa passivity, but you gotta pay for it, right? I mean, if you look at the the returns on a you know, a, a piece of real estate, you know, comparable purchase price piece of real estate cap rates at three, four, whatever, whatever they are. I don't, even, I don't even know what a cap rate is, Chris, but I'm making it up as I go. But, you know, a low cap rate, like you're, you know, you're looking at like a 30% IRR return on like the same purchase price with a business, right? So it's, but, but, but it's reflective of the level of uh, work that it's going to take and the risk, I think. So. What do you tell the people? Because uh, I again, I'm trying to think of the best way. I sometimes feel like I'm listening to people think I'm about to buy this business and do nothing. Like you've seen this happen enough. I think the question is how many of these, um, how viable is that model of buying a bunch of small businesses and staying as detached as possible? Like you've seen this play out enough. Is 
it seems to me what eventually happens as I've talked to a lot of these folks is like they think they're going to do a lot less and they quickly find out a year into it, they're way more involved. It might be called a hold co, but they're damn involved in these businesses. It's just like, oh, it's like running a lot of businesses is what it sounds like to me. Well, totally. And you know, you're probably reading a lot of stuff on social media and a lot of the business stuff on social media is just total content engagement you know, buy my course, you know, I'm going to teach you how to prepare and create a commercial cleaning business. And it's going to be great. You're going to use Jobber and it's going to be so easy. Um, you know, you're going to buy a business and you're, all you're going to do is take the fax machine and <laughs> put up a website and you're going to be good. Uh, that's just not the case, right? Like you're going to be actively involved if, if you want a good business, right? It, it's plausible um, to buy, you know, somebody bought that I know bought a, um, I won't say too much, but bought a roofing company and within about six months was able to scale down to like 10 to 15 hours a week in that business because of management. But, you know, the buck stops with you and you're just not going to find, I think the biggest fallacy is the idea that I'm going to go out and find an operator that's going to care about the business to the same level that I'm going to care about the business. That's going to want to go, you know, I've got a delivery that's, you know, didn't show up. That's two hours away. It's Friday at 5 PM. The, per, the, customers calling crying because it's for the daughter's wedding and who's getting in the car and driving that down to them. You know, it's not, it's not your operator. It's you like you, you're in those businesses. There's a point with which you can scale, you know, an organization, have a true holding company, you know, have different investment terms too, right? If you don't want to hold a hundred percent of these businesses, right. You could take minority interests and have I mean, I think that's one of the things that's interesting about business buying right now, Chris, is that there's this entire generation of like really incredible jockeys that instead of wanting to go do typical, you know, elite jockey stuff, they want to go run a commercial cleaning business in the middle of nowhere, right? And I'd rather give that dude my money and have them run that business with me supporting them than go run that business myself, me personally. Um, so those opportunities exist if you want uh, something that's close to you know being a limited partner versus being the operator, or the general partner in your world. How do you describe the silver tsunami? What's that mean? Oh, I love it. No, it's such an interesting... First of all, I have a trademark on that, so be careful. I, I don't want to have to have my lawyers reach out to you. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm kidding. I, I'm, not, I'm not kidding about owning the trademark, but... Uh, oh, no I'm kidding. kidding the, whole, the whole thing's a, just a shtick, just to have some fun. But... Um, uh, so the the nuts and bolts of it is there's the great wealth transfers going on. Seventy trillion dollars of baby boomer assets have to be transitioned in the next however many years to their children, the Xers and the millennials. And the idea is that some portion of that, and who knows how much, and on any given day, the value of things change. So, but they've said somewhere in the neighborhood of like seven to ten trillion of it is small businesses that have to be sold. Now we have this fight all the time, right? It's definitely happening. It's unquestionably happening that this is a period of time with which there's more supply or soon to be more supply than ever before. Now, the quality of that supply is the debate, right? A lot of these businesses probably should not be sold. They should probably be shut down, right? Because a lot of them, like we just talked about, are glorified jobs. But to me, I think that's missing the forest from the trees, right? My argument to that is, Yes, a lot of these businesses are not necessarily saleable, but that's a lot of economic activity and customers and work that needs to be done that's going to go somewhere, right? You may not necessarily want to buy a business in that space, but I think young, industrious people should certainly be looking at some of these industries um, that are aging and, and fragmented and saying, how can I get in now? Because in the coming years, a lot of these competitors are either going to shut down or if I go build a platform, I'll have an opportunity to roll up several of them. That's my take on the silver tsunami. Okay. And and I probably should ask this up front, but what's like a what's y'all's fastball size of businesses that y'all are working with? Because I think it's important. We're not you're not selling these buttoned up hundred million dollar EBITDA, you know, huge management team. I'm assuming maybe you are, but like Describe the kind of general types of businesses that y'all are working on right now. 
Yeah, two to fifteen million dollar enterprise value businesses is the sweet spot, right? There is a lot of interest below that. Economically, it gets a little challenging to buy a business like that. You're kind of buying a job. A lot of folks want to do it, and I I don't discourage anybody from buying a job. But two to fifteen million dollar enterprise value is a meaningful organization, right? You've got employees, and you know it's hard to put it in a box because they'll vary so much. I mean, some of these businesses are digital and they've got no employees, and some of them are you know, heavy service businesses that have a lot of employees. Um, but that's, that's, that's basically a two to 15 million. Okay. And, and of those two to fifth uh, of the, on that size, what's the percentage of sellers that you come across that you would say, these people have done the things they need to do to prepare to sell a business. Cause I tend to meet a lot of these people and think, look, they're just like, heads down year after year of building a business. They don't know all the fancy terms and jargon. They're just trying to put food on the table, treat their customers well and move on. So like, I'll start this conversation with how many do walk into your door and you're like, man, they're ready to sell. So we're rarely on the sell side. Like okay. 90% of our clients are buy side, okay. you know, small business buyers. Um, so I don't have a ton of visibility to that, except we do do some sell side work, but it's the business broker who's leading the spear on that. And there's two different types. There's a big push for finding the off-market business. And I caution buyers, particularly first-time buyers, heavily against that because of the deals that we see die, a, you know, a, a high percentage of those are off-market, proprietary search. I found you through whatever means, and now you've decided to sell to me. I think that buying from a business broker, as much as business brokers are horrible, and um, the, you know that industry needs to be revitalized. Um, sorry, Clint. Um, they serve an important role, right? And I think a business broker recently told me that by the time a business sells, a broker will have put probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 700 hours into the transaction. And a lot of that is getting that business ready to be sold. If it's a good broker and if it's a good business. But even then, like we run into it all the time where it's like, hey, we'd love to conclude financial diligence of this business, but like the seller's having a hip replacement and the box of papers is in the attic and she doesn't want to go get them. You know, she'll get them in three weeks or whatever. We're waiting, waiting, waiting in every deal. Um, so you're buying a small business and the idea that they'll have audited financials or any type of, you know, um, you know, digital system, it's, it's, it's a process. What, what shocks, what shocks the elite MBA is that situation you just described with the, uh, the documents in the attic, that lady's business is making $5 million of free cash flow a year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for sure. That's funny. Um, um, yeah, it, it, they're great opportunities, but uh, but it's also part of the thesis, right? The buyer goes, you know, I've got an opportunity to get in there. You don't have a website. You're not marketing. You have no CRM. You're not. Tra- you're sending trucks down the road that you're not tracking. You know, there's no efficiency in your process whatsoever, and yet you're making two and a half million dollars in. Well, this is pro- probably high. You're making a million and a half dollars in in earnings. You know, I can quickly come in, hopefully, assuming I can do the blue collar stuff and communicate with the worker, but I can implement some systems, bring some tech to the table, CapEx, we can, we can scale this thing. Um, so that's, that's where the, and then they're like, now I'm going to build a hold co, Chris. I'm gonna buy 10 of them. <laughs> All right. I'm not letting you Good off job. the hook. Why are business brokers terrible? And what is your idea for how to make that industry better? So I have no ideas on how to make it better. Um, <laughs> okay, it's fair not, enough. <laughs> not in my wheelhouse. I love to tease them. They, they, you know, they say the same things about us, and they're not wrong. Like small business attorneys are m- mostly terrible and stand in the way of getting these deals done. Um, but you know, they're they're terrible because they have a hard job. Um, they're down market, so they're not. You know, they're south of investment bankers. They're not dealing with the same level of sophistication with client, and then they get blown up. You know, you go to market with a a decent business and you get 600 emails, you know, and everybody wants to talk to you and you can't conceivably talk to all those people. And over time, the good ones are like, I know when someone's wasting my time before I even bother talking to them. And some of them take it too far and they're rude and they're whatever, short-sighted. And so they have a really bad reputation, but that's an enormously difficult, um, that's an enormously difficult industry. I know Mr. Huber is trying to get into that space and got to speak to him. And what's the difference between an investment banker and a business broker? Size of deal? Size of deal. 
Yeah, sophistication of the institution. They're just not going to play around in anything that's, I think, like the the historic or the customary cutoff that I hear is like a two million dollar EBITDA business is a business that would sell the private equity, and if it'll sell the private equity, then you know you can invest a little bit, and you know they charge a pretty big pre- premium. I think it's like. I don't know what their scale is, but like somewhere in the neighborhood of like 10% of the sale price. So pretty lucrative. Well, clearly you have to have seen one good business broker before. How would you describe somebody that's great at what they do in that space? Yeah, there are a number of, of niche business brokers that are really good. And we get some, I get surprised from time to time. Um, the vast majority of deals, it feels like the broker puts the sign in the dirt in front of the house, much like a real estate deal. And then they go away. And then miraculously, they show up at the three yard line when you're arguing about whether or not it's this or that. And they throw something out that just makes no sense. It's not constructive, does not advance the conversation at all. And we all have to go anyways, yeah. you know, <laughs> redirect back. Um, that's the typical business broker experience. But from time to time, I had one a few months ago uh, for a business in California where I had heard nothing, heard nothing. And then the buyer was like, we're closing in a few days. And I was like, no, you're not. He was like, no, we are. Like Live Oak, everything's lined up. Like the broker's been coordinating um, everything. And they were incredibly organized and on top of the details. And those are typically like, there are some for like the accounting space and different niche spaces that have their own and then work with the lender in a lockstep way. Worked with a really good one here in Orlando recently as well. Um, so they, they exist. It's, you know, it's an industry of, um, it's an industry of have and, haves and have not. So there's a lot of bad business brokers because they're not doing much work, much like re- real estate. Well, since you've represented a bunch of buyers, if let's just say you, you were a seller, what would you, what would you require of a business broker if you were going to hire them? I think that's the way I'm going to ask the question. The, the trick is, you know, you can get if 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 I were to take my business for sale by owner and put it on biz buy sell, I'd get an enormous amount of inquiries, right? So how do you bridge the gap? Because the distribution will be the easy part, right? It's the managing that relationship because I'm running a if I'm a seller too, I'm running a business, right? And I'm busy. Like most of these guys are in the weeds; they're not passive. I'm running this business and I need somebody who's going to grease the wheels and get the deal done um, and deal with vetting buyers, right? Because there are a lot of buyers, um, some, you know, better than others. And, um, you know, get it, getting getting a, a good buyer in front of me, I think would be the biggest thing. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about the buy side. Uh, let's, let's move over to the buy side. Um, First off, again, you okay, you do work with a lot of buyers. Is there something that you can tell almost the the minute you meet somebody of whether or not they're going to be a good buyer or not? Not really. No, I try not to prejudge. I spent some time in sales before law school and I, so I'm really careful about judging people until you've seen what they can do, right? Um, and, and the vast majority of our clients also are bringing us LOIs, right? We don't typically get engaged until they're under LOI. So they've done, or they're approaching LOI. So they're serious, right? They've done the legwork. Um, the best buyers, in my opinion, are obviously the ones with experience and deals under their belts, but the ones that have had failure, that have had a deal fall out, that have had that concrete experience to see the process, but have had some busted deal fees, they come back very impressive. Um, But otherwise, beyond that, you know, the business buying process is a long winding road that has a lot of off ramps. And we get a lot of, you know, we take a lot of crap on social media about like, you're encouraging people to buy businesses that shouldn't be buying businesses. Well, the good news is the people who shouldn't buy businesses never will because it's a long winding road with a lot of off ramps and the wrong people will get off the bus. The vast majority of the, the, of the wrong people will get off the bus because it takes grit. You're managing financial diligence. So you've got to understand the business from a financial perspective, make sure that what's being asserted to you is correct. You're managing the business diligence. So you're trying to understand the business model, the workings of things, how you're going to improve it, what's your business plan for it, the legal elements of things you're, you're, you know, running the the lawyer and the negotiation process and you're making legal decisions there. 
Um, the lender, you're convincing a lender to give you millions of dollars. You're sometimes convincing investors to give you millions of dollars. Um, and so it's a long, hard process that takes great. And oftentimes you're working a job too. And you've got a family, right? You got kids and whatever else. And like dad's wanting to move us from the suburbs of Virginia to Breckenridge, Colorado to run a fencing business. Like what the hell? Like we got to go get school. And it's, it's, it takes grit to get through it. And so my thesis is that a person that can pull that off, Chris, is good, is going to be successful in business, right? This is a gritty, determined, confident human being that is going to be as successful as anybody else. If they could do all that and get to the end of the process, like who am I to tell them that they're not qualified to, to run a business? Or buy a business. There's no shortcuts to, I mean, for the most part, to buying a business. That's a great framework. I think we'll call this part of the conversation then off ramps. Like, let's let's go from the start when I I'm gonna pretend I'm buying a business and I start with the LOI. And then let's just talk about how hard it is to get to closing. I think Brent Bashore calls it the knife fight. And you mentioned these off ramps. So, like, how many times am I gonna get an opportunity to kill this deal by the time we close? So Maybe let's just start with like LOI. What are things? Is it LOI or IOI? Uh, yeah. So I, 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 for the audience benefit, IOI stands for indication of interest. LOI stands for letter of intent. I mean, it's semantics, but the the way it works in, in practice is the indication of interest is usually like a very preliminary, like here's what I think I'll pay. Here's you know some very rudimentary um, things about the acquisition. Letter of intent is like. You know, here's the purchase price. Here's what it's going to be composed of. Transition services, due diligence, exclusivity is an important part of it, where you actually agree as the seller to take the business off the market for a period of time so that the buyer can exclusively pursue it, which is important for the buyer because if you don't have that, then you know you're at, you, you got to go, you know, pay money with the bank. You got to pay money with the lawyer. You got to pay money with the, the financial diligence partner. Um, you can't do all that if you don't have certainty around that the business is still being shopped. So a really important part of the letter of intent. But uh, more broadly, like it's very rare that an indication of interest is used in small business. Typically, we go to the LOI. But the LOI is not just, hey, Chris, I think you've got a great business. I want to buy Fort Capital. So here's a piece of paper and what I would pay. I mean, you and I have spent... This is your baby. You've built Fort for a number of years. It's you know, it's next to your wife, it's the love of your life. And you want to make sure that the person who's acquiring it is the right person to take the business or you may not even sell it. So we've spent a lot of time together. You've met with me, you've met with private equity buyers. I'm waiting in the lobby while the private equity people are in the office showing you spreadsheets and talking about how you, you know, this and that. And it's, it's been a whole process. And then I get in there, Chris, and I'm just some dude that has never run a real estate private equity firm before. And I got to convince you to sell me your baby, right? So we're looking at like pictures of my kid. Like you got a four and a six-year-old. I've got a two and a four-year-old. Like we're like talking about our kids. We're talking about business. We're talking about life. Like, you know, and, and, and so that's not easy, right? And the funny part about the LOI negotiation is in big law, you know, you're doing a $50, $100 million deal, whatever. Um, you'll go back and forth on that for weeks. It's very legal, very legal intensive and red line, red line, red line. In small business, you finally have that conversation. Chris is like, I like Eric. I want him to be the guy. Let's get the deal done. But I'm going to Cabo. I'll be back on Monday. So tell him to change these three things and then maybe we have a deal. You know, or we have a deal. So then the broker comes back to me and goes, hey, you know, we need to change this, this, and this, and then Chris will be back from Cabo on Monday, and maybe you have a deal. Um, and so then we go under LOI, right? And that is a that's a dance, and that to me is probably the biggest threshold in the business buying process: is can you get that business under LOI? The second biggest is now you're under LOI, and I, feel free to I'll pause there if you want to. Well, let me just ask in. you one thing before we move on. That's because I think if this is the biggest threshold. What are the, are there certain terms in an LOI that tend to, let's leave price out of it. Let's assume price is good. What are the deal killers in an LOI that people tend to have the most trouble getting on the same page with? I don't think that there's a singular deal killer necessarily. I mean, purchase price obviously is everything. What's the composition of the purchase price? How much is going to be paid in cash at closing? How much is in the form of a seller? No, because 
almost every deal in small business, you're going to ask the seller to finance 10% of the proceeds of the sale. And when they do that, you know, they're taking risk alongside you. So do they believe in you enough to do that? Um, Non-compete comes into play. You know, how long do you want me to sit out? If you're 70 years old and you're retiring, no big deal. But if you're 45, you're selling an ice cream business, but you also have a frozen yogurt business. I don't know. Um, you know, the slicing and dicing of that. How long do you want me to stick around, right? I'm 70 years old. I got a cruise around the world planned. Do you really want me to be in the business for 12 months? Or can I do give you six weeks and then I'm out of here? You know, those type of ticky-tack things. Um, but really it's purchase price. So. Dude, you have said so many things that are so verbatim. Like I'm going to Cabo. I'll see you on Monday. I can't tell you how many times I've heard of a buddy selling a big asset or something. And it's like, yeah, the seller's on vacation for two weeks. And you would think like, well, does the seller even care about selling this? It's like they do, but they're going on vacation and they'll just talk to you when they get back. It's, it's, uh, that's interesting. Okay. We're under LOI. Now, now what's the next set of off ramps? I, I'm going to be gifted. Yeah. So, ne- so now you're under a low, now you got to go convince a lender and, and hopefully you've been working with that lender, you know, during the LOI process, but you know, oftentimes you won't have been, you can take the LOI to the lender and you go, Hey, will you give me 5 million bucks to do this deal? Um, and they take you through credit. There's a long process with them. They ask for a business plan. They ask for a bunch of stuff, personal financial statements. You're talking to a bunch of lenders. And you're trying to figure out, is the business bankable? You know, a lot of these small businesses struggle. You know, if it's a construction business, is one example, and it has a lot of project-based work. Some lenders won't take that on. Um, and so, you know, it's it's quite likely that you find out after you've entered into LOI that you actually can't get the money to buy the business. And that happens. It's not super common, but it does happen. There's also a, you know, a, a longer process with the lender where you've worked with the business development officer, the BDO up front they've run their models and whatever their underwriting standard. And yes, this looks good. But now here we are six weeks later and it's got to go through credit committee. Credit committee comes back and says, yeah, we like the deal, but actually the debt service coverage ratio because of this ad back, yada, yada, you got to go back and renegotiate. You're going to have to put more in the form of a note or that note needs to be on standby. So it doesn't get paid back until we get paid back, whatever. They monkey with the deal. So that's tough. And then once you get to commitment from them, the last for a deposit of whatever, 10,000 bucks or somewhere in that neighborhood. That's a big hurdle. The other big hurdle and probably the second biggest next to the LOI is the financial diligence. Now you're under LOI. You understand the initial representations around the business, but you've got to go um, open the hood and you've got to do all of the interesting things that accountants do to figure out, is it true that they really make 850K in earnings? Um, oftentimes, and I highly recommend that people work with a quality of earnings partner who's an experienced financial diligence partner who can help you review those financials because it's complicated and moves fast. Um, and they're really good at finding things, but in almost every deal, Chris, and it's not an exaggeration when I say almost every deal, you'll see a softening against the marketed EBITDA. Either there's something with an ad back or, you know, the biggest, I think Clint Fiore actually had an amazing post recently about how uh, brokers will overstate values. And he laid out, you know, 10 of the most common things, um, things like that. They, they don't factor in, a, you know, they own the real estate or they have a lease, but it's not a market rent. And so they're paying under market. And so there hasn't been a proper adjustment to earnings for adjusting that, that rent, stuff like that. You almost always get to the end of the financial diligence process and have to go back to the seller and say, Hey, you know, you're wrong. You said it was 850. It's actually 750 or 700. Market price for this is three and a half times earnings. So instead of paying you 2.4, I'm going to, or whatever it is, forgive my math, but you know, instead of paying you X, I actually am going to pay you X minus whatever to compensate for the, the earnings. If you survive that, which the vast majority of the time you do, I think you do, because the sellers at that point, they're emotionally invested, right? First time they've, they've ever sold a business oftentimes. So the LOI is a big psychological threshold. They've had those, you and I've had those conversations about our kids. You're like, Eric's going to lead for Now we got to figure it out. More often than not, we can get past that. And if you do, then you've got like an 80% chance of getting to closing. But that's, I'll pause there because that's probably the biggest hurdle. Okay. 
Um, yeah, I want to stay on financial diligence for a second. So again, I'm just maybe generalizing here. So this could not be true. But uh, when I think of professional MBA, I probably think, okay, this might be the part of the transaction. They're going to be a little more, um, you know, th this is what they've studied up on is the financial side. When I think of a blue collar guy that's just good at the trade and he's handed a bunch of documents and saying, you know, hope hope you can figure out if I'm making 850, it gets a little more fuzzy. To be fair, I'd probably be more in that camp than the MBA camp myself. So you said the Q of E. So that's hiring a firm that you're going to pay what, 20, 30, 40,000 bucks to basically go through every document and confirm what earnings really are? It depends. Price is somewhere in the neighborhood of like 10 to 30K for a SMB deal. And some of these guys will do like, um, QOE lights, but that's, that's generally right. And so how, if, if we're talking about the blue collar guy, it's not a financial wizard, doesn't know all the terms, probably doesn't even know what EBITDA really means. They're just like, look, I know how to trim trees. I want to make more money. I want to do this thing. Maybe I'm simplifying it too much besides the Q of E and maybe you can speak from your role. Who else is kind of helping them get through this, this phase? Because it just seems to me there's lots of jargon at this phase of the, somebody calls it, jar, my buddy calls it jargon monoxide. Um, like, how do you, what are you telling people so that they make sure they're getting the answer and, uh, or the, the answer is, yeah, you just get a Q of V and listen to that. Well, you know, it's good to understand how P and L works, right? And the lender, the SBA lender, by the way, is accustomed to working with unsophisticated and underrepresented individuals. And so they're really good at forcing you to create P&Ls, business models. They're pushing you. If you don't know at the beginning, you'll know by the end about the financial workings of this business. Um, but the people who get in the most trouble, Chris, and this is the interesting part, are the more sophisticated people because they have a tendency to be overconfident. Right. I've been on Wall Street. I've been in investment banking. Like I can look at a small business's PL and do a proof of cash myself and I'll be fine. Right. Problem is, all the things I mentioned before are moving super fast. Right. And you're trying to do a proof of cash while you're managing legal and working with the bank and hanging out with your kids, maybe working a job. It's too much. And so they get in over their heads. And there's things that I've had deals where if they would have had for really sophisticated people, I mean, really sophisticated, smart people that if they would have done a QOE three months earlier, their deal would have closed or it would have died three months prior and we would have all moved on. But instead, we're having a knockdown drag out fight at the three yard line about whether or not checks cash, checks clear when they go out or they clear when they actually are cashed. So my recommendation is always to bring in that really smart second set of eyes, but it's your deal, man. Like you're buying this business, Chris. And like the moment I close on Fort, which by the way, I'm going to send you an LOI for Fort. I hope business, you do. But, uh, the, the moment I close on Fort, like nobody's coming to save me, man. Like you did my quality of earnings. Like you're not coming to save me. My lawyer's not coming to save me. Like maybe I've negotiated some strong contra con contractual protections and I've got indemnity and cover off certain reps and things like that, but nobody's coming to save me. So you have to, take ownership of it as well. And if you don't know the basics of financial accounting, like you probably shouldn't be buying a business. You probably should be working in a business first uh, or starting a business even with, with less risk um, before you take a couple million dollars in personally guaranteed debt. Okay. Uh, is, and, and I had one question and then we'll move to the next set of off ramps, but is working capital... A, it seems to me like in a lot of these conversations, that's always the lightning rod. Is that your experience too? Adjustments for working capital? It's it's an important thing that's often forgotten. It's probably the most important thing that's often forgotten, right? So for the audience's benefit, you buy a business and that business is made up of a bunch of stuff. The goal of the business is to produce cash, right? And then you're essentially paying for the cash that's produced in the past. And you're saying, because it made a million bucks last year, I'm going to pay two and a half to four million bucks to buy that cash, right? Well, one of the components, so you're buying all the stuff that creates the cash. You're buying the machine, right? Well, the machine doesn't operate if it doesn't have the, the working capital, which is 
um, inventory accounts receivables and um, actual cash to run the business. And the concern is you buy a business and then you're two weeks after closing, you got to make payroll, but you don't have any cash to make payroll, right? So buyers have to understand that that's just another asset of the business that was used to create that cash, um, much like any machine or anything else. If it's not there, that means you're going to have to go out and replace it on day one. If you have to go out and replace it on day one, that means your purchase price has indirectly been increased. So it's very customary in M&A to acquire working capital. We say normalized level of working capital subject to seasonality, whatever else, meaning how much cash and AR and inventory, whatever, does this business need to run in the ordinary course? Now, not how much does it have, Not how much uh, does it need now because I've got this debt to service, but how much did it need in the ordinary course? And then you negotiate that for it. The problem is you're in S&P land. You're down down market. You've got very unsophisticated sellers. They don't give a shit, Chris, about your need for cash. And they go, hey, that sounds nice, Chris, but it sounds like a you problem. When I started this business, I had to bring my own capital. You should have to bring your, your own as well. So you're back to that LOI negotiation. Do you complicate the situation and say, hey, I want working capital in the steel, um, not knowing at that point how much a normalized level of working capital even is. Um, or do you simplify and say, I'm either just going to adjust the purchase price for the working capital or I'll go get debt from my SBA lender to support whatever it is. The, where it gets difficult in the lightning rod issue, the problem issue is some businesses are more working capital intensive than others. If you're going to go buy a pool installation business that needs millions of dollars of working capital to build pools, that's a huge problem in your acquisition. So something that you've got to be cognizant of as a buyer that not many folks are. Right? Okay. At this at this point in the uh, in our journey, have we decided if this is an asset purchase or a stock purchase? And as an attorney, is do you have opinions on, I guess I'll just leave it pretty open. Do you have opinions on what they should be or shouldn't be? For our, our friends on YouTube, I'm drinking water from a... Uh, I, yeah, you are. I just came from the, gy- the gym like a, a frat guy here. So um, You look great. Did you get your creatine Thank in this morning? Sure. I did. I, I was pumping iron and did, did my CrossFit. It's good. It's a good day. Uh, it's Friday. Um, uh, so you decide early on asset purchase versus stock deal. You almost always want to go asset purchase, Chris, because when you buy assets of a business, you don't acquire any of the historical liabilities. The idea is... I'm buying the machine and I'm just going to buy the stuff, right? So anything you did with the stuff before I bought it, it's your problem. Anything after the fact, my problem. Uh, Sometimes that doesn't work, right? Because the stuff in the machine, which is like contracts and licenses and assets, won't be transferable as assets. And so to circumvent that, like a good example is we had a physical therapy clinic a few months ago. Um, and it had a bunch of contracts with insurance payors. You go in as a you know physical therapy patient and you're referred to this clinic because you have Blue Cross Blue Shield, right? And the contract between the clinic and Blue Cross Blue Shield is a really important asset of the business because in the absence of that, like these clients aren't coming through the door. Well, the problem is the contract with Blue Cross Blue Shield, and this is just a hypothetical, but the contract with the insurance payor says, if there's a change of control or an assignment of the assets or assignment of that contract, you got to come to me to get permission. Well, I probably don't want to do that, right? Because I don't want to upset the apple cart with Blue Cross Blue Shield and the seller's going, you're not going to go to them beforehand. You can buy it and see what happens. I don't care about that. But you're not going to do it before we close and risk upsetting the apple cart with that contract for me. And then you walk away and I've lost Blue Cross Blue Shield and I haven't sold my business, right? So Instead of buying the assets and, and triggering that, you'll go and you'll buy the whole business and you'll buy the stock, which under the contract may be permissible. So there's times that you've got to get cute. But the problem if you do that is now you've bought the business and all of the historical stuff that the business has done. And so you have to solve for, you know, hey, Chris is running for capital. Like he ran, he was drunk in 2014 and ran some lady down with his car. <laughs> This is, this is getting too specific. Um, God, you've been digging through the news or something? <laughs> so I've been Googling you, Chris. Um, <laughs> and uh, and now, you know, he was on four capital time when he did it. Now here we are and she's going to sue me because Chris did it. You know, that's a dumb example, but you guys get the point. So you got to slice and dice a little bit with that. But 
Um, yeah. All right. So we're through financial diligence. Uh, you have come to me and said your earnings. Actually, we found 500,000 more in earnings than you represented. I'm going to pay you more. And I said, all right, deal. Now what's the next set of on ramps? Yeah, for sure. For That's sure. how it Apple's always happens, right? Walls, you find more the earnings. In the walls. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, you make sure that the QOE report doesn't go to the client unless it has to. Um, so like that. So no. So at this point, so now you're through quality of earnings, financial diligence. You go, okay, the business is what it was represented as being financially. It's producing as much cash as it suggested it did. I've got the lender lined up. They've committed to give me the money. I've got my investors in line. They're committed to give me the money. Let's buy the business. So now the lawyer steps in and we draft purchase agreement. Um, you know, promissory notes, all of the various documents. We help out with the um, the capital raise. If you if you have investors. You know, there's uh, securities regulation stuff that has to happen, subscription agreement, investor questionnaires, and then ultimately more of most of these um, capital raises in small business are uh, Reg D filings, Reg D Form D filings with the SEC. Um, and then, you know, we're drafting the operating agreement for the acquisition vehicle. We are working with your lender because SBA debt is really good debt, Chris. Like it's a fantastic product. Acquisition SBA debt is the 7A product. It requires 10% down. It's got no covenants. You know, they're not watching you. It's really good debt, I'll save for the fact that it has to be personally guaranteed by you. That sucks. But um, other than that, it's fantastic debt. But getting that debt is a gigantic pain in the ass. And the lenders, some lenders are better than others. Uh, there's probably about four that if I were to go buy a business, I would only work with those four. Um, they do the very most. Um, they've got good processes, but there's a lot that do it and a lot that have relationships with brokers that want to do it. Um, and I always say it's like getting a mortgage from the DMV. It's a gigantic pain in the ass. We get sucked down that rabbit hole as your lawyer um, into those conversations. And they'll negotiate crazy stuff too because they're deal. And I sympathize with them because they're dealing with this SB. So the way SBA debt works is it's originated by a bank, but it's guaranteed by the SBA, similar to like your conforming product in residential mortgages. Um, if the buyer defaults and you've met the guidelines as a lender, then they guarantee 85% of it or whatever, 75% somewhere in that range. Um, but the lender is looking at this very extensive you know, set of standard operating procedures put out by the SBA that are oftentimes very vague and they struggle with that. And so we've run into crazy stuff where like we had a cosmetics brand that a buyer was going to buy. And then the SBA lender and their attorney came back and said, you can't buy this business with SBA debt because it's a violation of the Civil Rights Act because it's female marketed uh, makeup. Similar to like what you would expect. Like if I was trying to buy Augusta National and they didn't let women into the locker room, like, yeah, that's definitely a civil rights violation. Like federal government can't lend money to that institution. But th this was not, you know, this was, anybody could buy this product. It just happens to be pink was the upshot. Uh, so you run into stupid stuff like that. So those are the hurdles. You're kind of overcoming a bunch of very odd hurdles when you get into SBA debt, the investors, the purchase agreement. And then the final boss that you're going to fight, Chris, is the seller's attorney. Because now, and the thesis for our firm was there aren't good attorneys in the space. And like, that's definitely true. And now we got to go fight them to finish. And they will take forever to draft documents. They'll take forever to review documents. Some of them don't know m &A at all, make big deals out of little things. Um, and then you've got some that are just plain old assholes. Um, and so that's kind of your final hurdle before you get to closing. Give give a shout out to maybe a few of your lenders. Let's get let's get them some business right here. Who who are some lenders that do this stuff? Yeah, so the very best lenders. I tell everybody this. Bruce Marks at First Bank of the Lake is an extraordinary lender. He's been in search finance for a long time. This is in no particular order. Uh, he's been in search finance for a long long time, and Bruce got a ton of clout within First Bank of the Lake. Runs a great team. Um, Lisa Forrest at Live Oak Bank does a ton of SBA lending. Uh, Matt Dalski at Byline Bank um, and also Tom Lyons at Byline Bank are really good lenders. Um, Matthias Smith is a really good business broker at Pioneer Capital. You know, the, the brokers are, hey, I can't get through one of these good banks, so I'm going to work with somebody who's an expert to help me get across the finish line. Matthias is really good. Heather Anderson um, of Viso is a really good broker who just started her own shop. So we keep a, a list 
if folks are interested and reach out anytime, happy to um, to share that list. But those are those are the people I'd go to. All right, we've made it through our. We're pretty much headed to closing. I guess really just the question is. Once all the boxes are checked, what do you tell your clients? Like, obviously, we kind of talked about what's going to happen after they close, but what do you tell them the week before? They're about to make arguably the biggest investment of their life for some folks. Maybe for others, it's just another business they're buying. Like, how? what are the couple weeks look like before closing once kind of the green light's been given? Well, one of the, one of the things that happens a lot, it doesn't always happen, but it happens a lot, is they'll call me two to three weeks before closing and go, should I do this? Eric, should I do, should I do this? <laughs> and my answer is always the same. It's like, you do it. If you want to do it, do it. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. My, my uncle Tom pulled me aside two days before my wedding. And he was like, hey, man, like, just want to say, like, if you don't want to do this, if you want to do this, I support you. If you don't, I also support you. And I'll have the car running and ready to get out of here, you know? And he was set. He was <laughs> But it's the same thing with this, right? I mean, when you anybody who's making these big life decisions, they've got it's got to be their own decision. It doesn't matter what you've done, escalation of commitment. Who cares? But try to be objective and unemotional about it. Um, and um, you know, but, but when and once you close, like you live with it. And we're humans, man. We're really adaptable. Most of these people are successful people. And they're going to be successful. It may not, you know, even if it's not this acquisition, like I'm not betting against a 27 year old Wharton grad over a 30 year time frame. It's not, you know, so then they're not all Wharton guys, but you get the point. Yeah. Um, if, if you are a buyer of a business that doesn't plan to be active, and but you're also maybe the, the current CEO or the owner, whatever we're calling them, is rolling over, but you're putting a CEO in, can you maybe just speak a little bit to maybe what you do? Because you have your buying business, but you're also putting in a CEO that may probably has a little bit of ownership. I'm, I'm assuming you're going to push for them getting either some type of ownership or some type of upside, but is there anything you try and get done from a legal perspective to help out? How do you help get the new CEO in place throughout this whole process? So that, that's fairly uncommon, right? The idea that like I'm a buyer and I'm bringing an operator with me. It happens sometimes. Um, there's not a ton of um, asks from us like, hey, I, what, what should I do with this guy or gal? Because presumably if they're coming with you and they're fresh to the organization as well, then like you kind of know where their heart and head is at. The tricky part is I'm buying a business and I'm buying the Fort Pod. Chris is out. I'm the new host. I'm keeping Johnny, the producer. Um, Johnny, like you and I got to sit down. Like I got to make sure that like you're bought into this, like you're integral to make sure that the podcast continues to, to hum along like it has. And, you know, you've done 300 episodes of this. I'll be doing my first. Like, what can we do contractually to make sure that you've got an incentive to be with me for at least 12 months? You know, is that money? Is it just having that heart to heart and feeling like we've got a meeting of the minds? Or is it actually something contractual? So that's that's more of that's that's a more common scenario. OK, so the CEOs usually if the new CEO is coming in, it's usually post acquisition after a period of time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, I've only, tr truthfully, I mean, we've done, you know, 250 million in deals in 12 months or somewhere in that neighborhood. And um, I, that's not a common, you're just not, in, you're not buying a sub $15 million EV business and installing an operator very early on. Okay. That's good to know. Um, I wanted to talk just real quick about, I had the note management buyouts that you do. Can you just talk, what is a management buyout? And is it the same thing as buying a business or is it different? Um, so it's a type of M&A where you can sell the business to the managers, or there's a similar concept called an ESOP, an employee stock option purchase or whatever the acronym stands for. Point being is you're selling the business to the existing management or you're selling it to the existing employees, which is even more complicated. Um, those are, um, you know, those are mid-market M&A concepts. We don't see that a ton in SMB. Um, and, and maybe it does happen, but we just don't see it because of the nature of our clientele. You know, our clientele are out ex 
you know, external third party buyers. And maybe there are a lot of, and that was actually what we were concerned about with the uh, the partial guarantee, or sorry, the partial rollover SBA rules that made a lot of news in the last couple of months where they, you know, the SBA was saying, instead of having to buy 100% of a business, you can now buy less than 100%, which is a big change. It, you know, has a lot of implications. They they fumbled the bag by making the sub, uh, the, the rollover equity holder, whether it's the existing owner owns 1% or owns 50%, they have to have a personal guarantee on your SBA debt and nobody's going to do that. So it went away. Um, but we were more concerned about that. I think if that was going to become a reality. So anyways. Uh, this is more around the roll up. So you got a guy uh, or gal that's bought a business, um, they're running it, and now they're just acquiring other businesses like that. So it could be plumbing, and now they're just buying more plumbing business, but it's all going into one business. Like it's just a one bigger business that keeps buying. Is there anything from a legal standpoint that changes where the scenario we talked about earlier is like you're just buying a one off business? And you're going to go own it. Now you're buying businesses that are going into another business. Is there anything to consider there? Well, so now you're talking Holdco, right? And this is where everybody that's driving us, listening to this is going to turn up the radio going, can't wait to build my Holdco. Bye. Real quick. Is it a Holdco though? So let's say you own Fort Capital now, and now you're going to go buy uh, you know, ABC Industrial Buyer LLC, and they're just going to become part of Fort Capital. Are you just calling Fort Capital now a Holdco or... You're basically merging oper. You're combining the company and merging it into the existing operation. So you wouldn't want to do that, right? That, and that's why I would become Holdco because the moment you merge those two entities, all of a sudden, any dumb thing that this business has done, or any dumb thing that that, that or any liability, I guess you should characterize it more professionally, any liability of the two gets commingled, right? And I would hate to, you know, have a fifteen million dollar EV, fantastic cash cow business. I go buy a $1 million tack on and I smush them together. And then the tack on gets sued for something and the plaintiff gets access to all of the assets of the, the $15 million cash cow disaster. Right. So you, so you create the holding company, you got a parent entity and the enduring ventures guys, by the way, have talked about this ad nauseum. It's a great subject. The mini Berkshire Hathaway, it's a very popular concept, but you know, you'll have a mothership um, and uh, off of the mothership will be your portfolio companies. And so you would just create that holding company to, to hold Fort Capital. And it would be Chris Powers, whatever, LLC, holding LLC. And then you would buy that other company off of that. The beauty of it is the way that tax works is now you can offset P&Ls as long as you own more than 80% of each and you know consult a tax lawyer. But you know broad strokes, as long as you own more than 80% of both, then losses from this one can be, you know, offset earnings from this one. Um, and so it creates the tax incentives. You can also then implement, you know, like shared services where you've got employees in a sub entity that are being shared throughout the organization. Um, you know, you want to be careful. You want to keep them at arm's length so you protect that legal liability, but you would never smush them together. That's your typical holding company. Even if they're diversified, they're not in the same, um, business, but they're owned by the same people. That's your your classic hold co. And there really wouldn't be a good reason to keep them out of the same hold co unless I don't know, consult a tax lawyer, I guess. But but they but if I bought that company and I wanted them to wear Fort Capital, they work at Fort Capital when they're out in the market, they're saying I work for Fort Capital. You're just talking about how it legally shows up on paper, but not how the outer facing world sees the business. Yeah. And if you wanted to universally brand them the same, I mean, that's how pretty much every multinational corporation works. You know, like think about like Coca-Cola as an example, like Coca-Cola is a conglomerate of, you know, they probably have hundreds of entities under the Coca-Cola parent public company. Um, and they all say, you know, when they show up places, they all have Coca-Cola polos and they all work for Coca-Cola, but they all work for, you know, different Coca-Cola entities legally. All right. I have a few uh, fun ones um, real quick. What's your take on chat GPT? Is it going to, are you, are you out of a job soon and uh, you're going to be looking to actually buy a business or what's going to happen to lawyers? Well, I think so chat GPT is going to, well, AI is going to rock the legal profession, right? And anybody who says otherwise is just burying their head in the sand. And you're talking about like the phone booth repair guy and 
1980 that was like, there's going to be phone booths forever. You know, it's it, they're they're you, you got to learn to leverage technology, whether it's AI or anything else. It's going to get smoked. But yeah, I got I got a lot of attention because I posted this like very hilarious hyperbolic. I was trying to be funny. It was like a Saturday night, threw it up randomly, and it was like. ChatGPT is going to, I don't even know what I said, but it had like the Elmo meme with the fire. It was like, it's going to destroy the legal profession. Yeah. It was seen by like 30 million people. <laughs> oh my God. I was like, oh my God, I would have, I would have edited that a little more if I had known it was going to go so far. But um, uh, it's, it's a real thing, you know, and there's, there's smart people like Goldman Sachs put out a report saying that of all the professions that will be hit the hardest by AI, administrative support is one. But they were saying somewhere in the neighborhood of like 46% of legal jobs will be op- made obsolete by AI. And if you've been inside the legal profession, like it's a lot of copying and pasting and correspondence and very administrative related stuff. So um, I don't know, but it sucks. Like it kind of, some days it sucks, Chris. Like you get on ChatGPT and you're expecting magic and then you just don't get it. And uh, it's especially with like the content creation, like there's no way Chris Powers and your voice and your personality, your business experience, there's no way somebody's going to come along with just a bland, AI-driven text, whatever, and do more than you. It just isn't going to happen. I agree. Do you have any stories of salvaging businesses out of bankruptcy? We, we've we worked on a lot. So even particularly in my big law days, working on like distressed work um, and in energy you know, I worked on a few like debtor side things and all that of businesses that were struggling in Texas and in um, oil field services. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I worked on a few bankruptcies and restructurings, um, particularly because I started in Texas in 2015, right? Like right when commodities had crashed, they were struggling then. And then in my time at Kirkland, like that's one of the um, elite um, debtor side bankruptcy groups in the country, and so. Um, there's, there's a lot of that. I mean, buying distressed assets, like that's not what we do in SMB. Like we don't buy distressed assets. Like we buy like enduringly profitable 30 year old companies. And that's, I would encourage anybody out there. Like I had somebody come to me, smart guys from like NYU business school. And they were like, we're going to buy, we're going to do SMB, but for distress. And I was like, that's brain damage, man. Like do it, have at it. Like you're, you know, you're going to add a ton of value, probably make a ton of money, but like, that's going to be hard work. All right. Um, one more. We we kind of missed this. I should have asked this earlier, but do you recommend reps and warranties in insurance on most of the deals? So that product doesn't work well in SMB because of the pricing and a lot of there's one uh, there's really one product CSC that offers a like SMB style rep and warranty insurance. What what I what I recommend, Chris, is um, being dumb like a fox when you know M and A. If you know what rep and warranty insurance is as a small business buyer, then you probably know what all the mid market terms are for indemnification: twelve to twenty four months for ordinary reps, purchase price, you know, caps and baskets and deductibles. What I would encourage people to do is to be dumb like a fox when you when you enter the S and B space because the sellers don't know what that is, the brokers don't know what that is. And if they go out and hire the wrong lawyer, they sure as hell don't know what that is. And so you're able to get significantly better indemnity terms, terms that would be considered crazy in mid-market in, in S&B, so long as you don't go out and pre-bake your LOI with all that mid-market stuff. You got to make the big grandiose ask the first time in S&B and then kind of test the waters and see what you're dealing with. That's my recommendation. Eric? You the man. Thank you for today. Yeah, this was fun. I can't. I can't wait to uh, own both your podcast and your. I was going to say. I don't. After this podcast, I don't own anything anymore. <laughs>